On this week in Enterprise Tech, we have Mr. Curtis Franklin and Mr. Brian G here today. Now, last week we talked about the passwordless world, but what are some of the other alternatives that are out there and are they maybe even scaring your users away? We'll talk about that. Plus, in past episodes, we talked about the controversial things like law enforcement's role in helping you and your organization fight cybercrime. Well, we'll go deeper into that and maybe even strike a nerve or two. Now, as if that wasn't enough, moving your organization to the cloud is definitely not easy and the pandemic has definitely accelerated it. Well, our guest today, Justine Schaffer from Cummingbird Networks, is going to give you some good information on how to ensure your remote workers are secure and how hybrid networks are definitely possible. Shouldn't miss it. Twilight on the set. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twilight. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 442, recorded May 7th. 2021 hybrid or not this episode of this week in enterprise tech is brought to you by melissa like expired milk 30 percent of your customers data goes bad every year that's money down the drain visit melissa's developer portal for free access to data quality apis demos and code samples freshen up your sour data today with 1000 records clean for free at melissa.com slash twit and by worldwide technology and intel with an innovative culture thousands of it engineers application developers and unmatched labs and integration centers for testing and deploying technology at scale wwt helps customers bridge the gap between strategy and execution to learn more about wwt visit wwt.com slash twit and by it pro tv Get the IT certifications you need to be successful in your current role or future career. Visit itpro.tv slash enterprise for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription. Use code enterprise30 at checkout. Welcome to Twyat This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I am your host, Louis Moreski, your guide through this big, giant world of the enterprise. But I can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals, the experts in our field, starting with our own Mr. Curtis Franklin. He is a senior analyst at Omdia and a very busy guy in the world of security. Curtis, how are you doing, my friend? Oh, Lou, it's been a busy week, but a, a good one. You know, we just finished up Black Hat Asia, and now all eyes turn to Black Hat USA, which is scheduled for the end of July and beginning of August. We learned a lot of good lessons, had a lot of great information there at Black Hat Asia, and uh, makes everyone who was involved excited for even bigger and better things to come in just a few weeks. Indeed, indeed. Now, you, uh, Dark Reading, just had a uh, recent anniversary, didn't they? Yeah, we keep uh, moving forward. Dark Reading is now seriously into the teenage years. Uh, it's fascinating. Even though I'm not formally uh, full-time on staff there anymore, having slid over to OMD, I think of it fondly, having been on staff and having worked with them for years. You know, I was one of the first columnists at Dark Reading. And then I worked with them through the years uh, doing podcasts f with them and uh, basically helping them get their message out. It's a great bunch of people doing fabulous work. And they've got some exciting things coming up in their uh, new year, new looks and experiences for their website, lots of information tied around Black Hat. So I'm really excited to have them as, well, corporate cousins. Right, 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 right. Well, looking forward to all the all the content and all the stuff. Well, speaking of busy, we have Mr. Brian Cheese, an ed architect at Sky Fiber and the Sunshine Tinkerer. Mm, I think we need to come up with a better name than that. But nonetheless, he's always on the move. Chebert, how is the Sunshine State treating you? So far, so good. I'm really looking forward to enjoying my new pool. But I'll tell you. There's been some real interesting developments. The Aloha Cabled Observatory still has me on staff, even though I'm remote, and they are going out on the Kila Moana very soon, our uh, swath hall. And if all goes well, the new floodlights will be out, and I'll be able to share the the um, 
full-time link for webcams three miles under the water, which ought to be a lot of fun. Very cool. Very cool. Now, now, have you uh, tapped into that uh, fiber line behind your house yet? I have <laughs> still not been able to find who owns it. I'm really <laughs> considering seeing if I could just disconnect it and see who comes. I'd never do such a <laughs> thing. Idea. Oh, that'd That's be horrible. <laughs> Actually, I'm going through, I'm trying to find access to the county GIS maps so that I can go and track down the communications conduits and see who's registered to use them. Maybe, just maybe, I can finally get some metro fiber into my house. Indeed. Well, we anxiously await the day that you do tap into it. But for now, it's been a busy week in the enterprise. And we have a great guest. We had a great guest last week as well, but we had a great guest this week. Uh, and last week, they talked about the passwordless world, but... What are some of the other alternatives, right? What, do there other options actually scare users away? We'll talk about that. We'll get into that. Plus, in past episodes, we've also talked about controversial things as law enforcement's role in helping you and your organization fight against cybercrime. We're going to go a little deeper into it. We might just actually hit a nerve. But uh, as if it wasn't enough in a full show there, we, we have a, we've talked about the cloud before. But we're going to go deep into how you can start implementing in a full hybrid environment along with your remote workforce today. We have a great guest, Justine Schaffer. She's from Hummingbird Networks. And she's going to take us through all of it. But first, like we always do, let's go ahead and jump in this week's blips. As Black Hat has come and gone and Black Hat America is coming, we hear more and more about sleeper malware. Now, for example, researchers this past week disclosed a novel malware that uses various tricks to stay under the radar and evade detection while stealthily capable of executing arbitrary commands on infected systems. Called Pingback, the Windows Malware Leverages Internet Control Protocol, ICMP, or ICMP, tunneling. So why does it use ICMP? Well, because it's uh, for covert bot communications, of course, allowing hackers to utilize ICMP packets to piggyback attack code. Now, Pingback uses the OCI.dll to stay covert by loading itself into a legitimate service called MSDTC. Now, that's also named Microsoft Distributed Transaction Coordinator. And if you've done any Windows development in the past 10 years, you probably already know about DTC. It's this application is into handling transactions for you and database operations. Now, how does Pinback exploit DTC? Well, it takes advantage of a DLL search order hijacking method, and which involves using a genuine application to preload malicious DLL files. Now, Pingback gets its name from one of the plugins acquired required for supporting the Oracle ODBC interface in MSDTC in a key, and it's actually key to its attack. Now, MSDTC isn't configured to run automatically on startup on most machines. However, virus total samples submitted in July 2020 was found to install a DLL file into the Windows system directory and start the MSDTC service to achieve persistence. Now, that specific example raised the possibility that a separate executable is crucial to install malware. Upon successful execution, though, Pingback resorts to using ICMP protocol for its primary communication. Now, ICMP is a network layer protocol used primarily for sending error messages and operational information, say a failure alert or when another host becomes unreachable. Specifically, Pingback takes advantage of echo requests for ICMP tunneling. Now, you know, may be wondering what you can do to protect your machines. Well, the first thing is, you know, applications aren't using MSDTC, just disable the service. That's the first thing. The next thing is make sure your virus protection software is up to date. And the final thing is educate your users. Well, it's Friday, so you know what we're going to be talking about. That's right. Yet another solar wind story. This time, government agencies from the United States and United Kingdom have teamed up to issue a new joint advisory detailing tactics, techniques, and procedures of Russia's Foreign Intelligence Service, or SVR, after the solar wind supply chain attack was publicly attributed to the group. The FBI, NSA, Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, we're joined by the United Kingdom's National Cybersecurity Center, or NCSC, to provide more details on SVR activity, including the exploitation that followed the SolarWinds Orion software compromise. SVR has been seen leveraging publicly available exploits to target a range of vulnerabilities and, quote, seeks to take full advantage of a variety of exploits when publicized, end quote. The flaws SVR targets include the widely reported Microsoft Exchange server vulnerabilities in addition 
to vulnerabilities affecting Cisco, Pulse Secure, VMware, Oracle, WebLogic, Citrix, and Fortigate products. Post-compromise, SVR attackers have used Cobalt Strike, their big software package, to carry out operations after initial exploitation as seen in SolarWinds. They've also used GoldFinder, GoldMax, and Cybot malware after compromising an organization via that solar winds breach. Okay, when I first read this article, it starts off by saying hundreds of millions of Dell laptops, notebooks, and tablets are at risk of compromise from a set of five high-severity flaws that have been undetected since at least 2009. Hundreds of millions? Maybe. Stop and think. Dell has been wildly successful at marketing their products and with a compromise that goes across large swaths of their product line. Maybe it is hundreds of millions. Well, the flaws allow an attacker who already has some level of initial access on a system to escalate privileges and gain kernel-level access on it. Security researchers from Sentinel-1 discovered the bugs in Dell's DBUtil, a driver that is installed and loaded during the BIOS update process on Dell Windows machines. Dell was notified of the issue in December 2020 and has since issued an update for it. In an advisory and FAQ today, the hardware maker offers measures that organizations can take to identify whether they have been impacted and steps they can take to address the issue. Quote, we remediated a vulnerability, CVE-2021-21551, in a driver, dbutil underscore two underscore three dot sys, affecting certain Windows-based Dell computers. We have seen no evidence this vulnerability has been exploited by malicious actors to date, according to a Dell spokeswoman in an emailed statement to Ars Technica, while urging organizations to follow the company's remediation steps as soon as possible. Sentinel-1 researchers discovered the vulnerabilities while investigating the security posture of the Dell driver, which has been in use since 2009. The security vendor describes Dell as having included the vulnerable driver in BIOS update utilities for literally hundreds of millions of business and consumer computers over the past 12 years. Well, the ouch factor here is that this driver has been around since 2009, as we said. And since it's part of the BIOS update um, system, it's rarely updated. So while doing a BIOS update is good practice, the reality is production machines tend to go oh, ouch, much longer without such a low-level update. More and more malware is targeting cryptocurrency these days, and a new, mal new type of malware dubbed Panda Stealer by researchers is spreading through spam emails and malicious Discord links and has its sites set firmly on your valuable cryptocurrency. That's right. According to Trend Micro, the phishing emails appear as business quote requests with an XLSM file, one of those macro files attached there, as in that it loads a macro. Now, Panda Stealer appears as an innocent XLSM file with, with those macros. Once enabled, though, it downloads a loader that executes the main Stealer application. Now, alternately, an XLS file may be downloaded containing a formula that actually hides a PowerShell command that accesses pasty or paste bin alternative to download a further PowerShell command. Once running, the Panda Stealer tries to detect keys, addresses, and other data associated with cryptocurrency transactions and wallets holding funds, including Dash, Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Ethereum. Now, right now, we are unsure if the la latest cryptocurrency Chia is affected here. Now, we'll also attempt to steal credentials from other applications such as Nord VPN, Telegram, Discord, and Steam. In addition, it's capable of taking screenshots of the infected computer and sucking data from the browsers like cookies, passwords, and cards. Now, Panda Stealer seems to be a variant of the Collector Stealer, uh, a cracked build freely available online now. Now, while there's no evidence yet of the particular criminal group behind Panda Stealer, Trend Micro was able to identify an IP address being used by the malware for command and control. Now, it led to a rented shock house uh, hosting virtual server and having... Uh, having been reported, the server has been suspended. However, this may not be enough to quiet the threat. Now, VirusTotal found 264 similar files in its database, calling home to 144 or 140 more command and control servers and more than 10 download sites. Now, some of them from Discord is used to share the malware behind criminals, as 
We've always say on this show, if you want to stay protected and protect yourself from the latest malware, you may stay up to date, may stay up to date. But the latest versions of Excel will also warn you about odd macro packages as well. So do yourself a favor, inspect them before just, you know, running them blindly. Well, in some security good news, Google is planning to automatically enable two-factor authentication. Google, you see, is rolling out two-factor authentication by default in order to better secure accounts. Noting that the announcement took place on World Password Day, that's yesterday for those keeping track, the tech giant says it is asking people who have been enrolled in two-step verification to confirm their participation, and users who have not will be automatically enrolled, assuming their accounts are appropriately configured. In a release announcing the move, Mark Risher, Director of Product Management for Identity and User Security at Google, said, quote, You may not realize it, but passwords are the single biggest threat to your online security. They're easy to steal, they're hard to remember, and managing them is tedious. This story is about Peloton, the fancy-smancy exercise bike and um, treadmills. But unfortunately, in this case, the user's private data, including birthday, location, gender, weight, and workout statistics, were exposed to the public due to a leaky application programming interface, according to a story in TechCrunch. The bug with the API, which is software that facilitates communication between applications, made Peloton users' info vulnerable to data scraping attacks similar to those used against Facebook. Peloton says the bug has since been fixed. A security researcher originally discovered the API vulnerability, which allowed him to access the user data even among Peloton profiles that were set to private. The TechCrunch story reported that the researcher told Peloton on the f of the flaw on January 20th, but the vulnerability still wasn't fixed three months later. After the 90-day grace period, that security tester's typically give companies to fix a vulnerability. The publication said that after that deadline, it asked Peloton why the researcher's information had been ignored and was told the bug had been dealt with. Asked to comment on the TechCrunch report, a Peloton spokesperson said in a statement that the company's communication with the researcher was lacking. Quote, it's a priority for Peloton to keep our platform secure and we're always looking to improve our approach and process for working with the external security community, according to the spokesperson. Though our coordinated vulnerability disclosure program, a security researcher informed us that he was able to access our API and see information that's available on a Peloton profile. We took action and addressed the issues based on his initial submissions, but we're slow to update the researcher about our remediation efforts. Going forward, we will do better to work collaboratively with the security research community and respond more promptly where vulnerabilities are reported. Well, it's unclear whether any malicious actors accessed the personal information while it was exposed. So, it's interesting. So now, even an exercise bike is going to spy on me. You know, what's the world coming to when even exercising becomes hazardous to my cyber health? It's relatively rare that you hear about a casino being hacked. Why? Well, because casinos can afford to spend the big bucks to ensure that they're secure. It's their livelihood. Well, this new report will have you wondering and maybe even laughing at the same time. Secure your laptop, secure your smartphone, secure your tablet. And before I forget... Secure your fish tank. Yes, you've heard me right. That's right. Secure your fish tank. Well, recent security report from a firm talked about how hackers were able to infiltrate a casino in a very unconventional way. That's right. The attackers used that a fish tank thermometer to get a foothold on a network. They then found the high roller database and pulled back the data across the network and out of the thermostat and then up to the cloud. Now, can this be possible? It certainly can. And you can blame it on the Internet of Things. That's right. To think about think about this, by 2025, some analysts predict that there will be as many as 31 billion connected devices worldwide on IoT things. Now, this is a good thing because the smarter you make these objects, the more information they can glean from them to ward off issues and optimize their use. In fact, Rolls-Royce, for example, Rolls-Royce examples is using uh, IoT connected airplane engines to report back performance data on the fly. But all these connected devices are created an enormous gap and opportunity 
for hackers. Now, that's because of many of them are, aren't equipped with the kinds of security protections seen in laptop servers and phones and tablets. And unfortunately, many of us aren't aware of all those risks. Now, how do we and as biz, business owners actually address the problem? Well, the really only tactic is to stay ahead of it. This is why it's important to regularly bring in an IT expert to complete assessments on the network as well as your IoT devices. And uh, But we, we need to make sure that such an assessment also includes evaluating any and every connected device. Now, that means our you know, building heat, heating controls or smart speakers or smoke detectors, alarm systems, and over, overhead lighting, even the coffee machine is reviewed and audited. Oh, and don't forget the fish tank. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But before we get to the bites, we have to thank a really great sponsor of this week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Melissa. Now, have you ever forgotten to uh, check the date on a carton of milk? I definitely have, and it's really easy just to store it away and just forget about it. And like milk, your customer data can also go bad, sometimes even faster than milk. Now, to put it into perspective, up to 30% of customer data goes bad each and every year. Now, think about your customer base. That is a lot of customers. That's when Melissa is there for you. And Melissa, make sure your data is accurate and current so you reach the right customers. Now, their tools have helped businesses maintain fresh data for over 35 years. That's why over 10 thousand businesses trust the address experts now you can verify address emails phone numbers and names in real time with melissa melissa's global address verification service verifies addresses for over 240 plus countries and territories at the point of entry you can validate existing customer data and find new customers as well tired of having duplicate customer information in your database well with Melissa's data matching, you can eliminate clutter and duplicates, increase accuracy of the database, and reduce postage and mailing costs. Now, get the information that completes your customer profiles better and more thoroughly. You can add customer demographic information to your records, such as property data, marital status, and social media handles as well. Now, Melissa's flexible deployment options offer different platforms to suit any preference business size, or even budget with flexible on-premise web service, secure FTP processing, and software as a service delivery options, you can choose the best way to meet your unique business needs. Now, Melissa continually undergoes independent security audits to reinforce their commitment to data security, privacy, and compliance requirements. They're SOC 2, HIPAA, and GDPR compliant. Plus, congrats to Melissa. They were named a leader in address verification by G2 Crowd in their spring 2021 report. Not a surprise at all. Congrats, Melissa. Now, Melissa is supporting communities as well and qualifying essential workers during COVID-19. See if your organization qualifies for six months of free service by applying online at melissa.com. Don't put up with sour customer contact data Try Melissa's APIs in the developer portal. It's easy to log on, sign up, and start playing in the API sandbox 24-7. Get started today with 1,000 records cleaned for free at melissa.com slash twit. That's melissa.com slash twit. And we thank Melissa for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's now time for the bites. Now, the last episode of Twilight, we had a great guest on, Tom Jarella. He talked about the evolution of passwords and how passwordless revolution is upon us. Now, the question is, has passwords outlived its usefulness? Good question, right? Well, Bill Gates famously equipped uh, and talked about that password was dead back in 2004. Now, of course, his forecast might have been a little premature. Still, he was right when he said that the traditional password couldn't meet the challenge of creating or keeping critical information secure. Now, many researchers have pointed out that more than 80% of all data breaches could be attributed to poor passwords, if you think about it. Now, businesses know this, which is why they're constantly encouraging employees to create more complex passwords, right? And then they're also trying to layer out password security with things like two-step and certificate-based authentication. But while these technologies actually might help mitigate password vulnerabilities, they can't eradicate it. So we need to keep inventing ways of making passwords more secure, propping them up as a viable way to secure our data. For for example, two-step authentication doesn't exactly what it sounds like it does. They're requiring an additional step uh, in the login process beyond simply just entering your password. Once the users enter the password, 
the password, the person then sent a text message with a unique code or, or asked to generate one via authenticator. So, yes, it does add a layer of security, especially if the hacker steals your password, but it can access the account unless you do also have that authenticator as well. Now, don't get me started on SMS-based MFA. Do, do yourself a favor. Definitely don't use it. Uh, that means you too, Bank of America. <laughs> Excuse me. Unfortunately, MFA does add additional complexity to user flows. And uh, in fact, risk-based authentication is the next phase there, which involves asking users to jump through additional hoops if they exhibit user, you know, unusual login patterns, such as logging in from a foreign country or via a new IP address. Um, that is actual, actually has similar issues as well. Now, they frustrate users and increase the login times. I know I've, I've had a bunch of issues recently with a uh, unnamed bank uh, that took me through about 20 minutes worth of that. Now, certificate-based authentication recognizes humans as a fallible guardian of their password and does away with them entirely instead of shifting the focus onto the network itself. A user or device can be granted network access for a set of period until the access expires, and it's as simple as that. Well, it's not that simple because this is only useful for particular circumstances and limits how and where the customers and employees can work. The question is, what's next, right? Well, last week, Tom talked about self signed certificates as a user on your client to replace those ins insecure passwords. Now, there are also SSO providers that we add into the mix. These are things that add more complexity, like Microsoft has AAD and Okta, and there's Ping and Forge Rock. But what does a person do to make this better? Uh, Curtis, I want to throw this to you first. I want to start with you. Is Bill Gates finally right here? Are passwords on the way out? Well, I think that passwords are on their way out in the same way that uh, internal combustion engines are on their way out. Um, <laughs> there is an inevitable direction of technology, and it leads away from passwords for all the reasons that, that you explained there in the article. I mean, there, there are uh, relatively few things that argue in passwords favor other than the past that uh, fact that we're used to them. And here's the fascinating thing. The, the desirability for passwords in the minds of many users has nothing to do with their actual strength as judged from uh, a security perspective. They just feel more secure when they type in that password. So I think what we're going to see is this evolution where more and more two-factor authentication comes in and ultimately where you now have, say, a username, password, and some sort of biometric or token or additional challenge for the second factor, we're going to see more and more things with that biometric or, um, or uh, token-based factor plus something like a behavioral factor. Uh, put those together, add in a username, and you've got access. One day, we're going to just wake up and realize that we haven't had to actually type a password for anything in the last month or two, and we'll realize that we enjoy leaving them behind. Definitely enjoy leaving my passwords behind. And Chibert, I want to throw this to you because with a lot of all the systems that organizations need to access, including IT pros, I mean, they need to access data admin access to different environments and different services. You think really passwords are going to go away anytime soon? I think passwords have their use if used properly. Um, I'm quite fond of passwords with a challenge. Um, type a password in and then a 2FA, you know, have a text message sent. That's, I'm kind of fond of that. Now, there are systems that are, go quite a bit further. You know, we have in the military, we, we've actually had people that have an electronic key. It, it, crypto keys actually look like physical keys and you actually have to physically turn them. So those are actually, I used to have one that I'd carry around my neck. Now, I couldn't just use it just by sticking it and turning it. I would have to unlock it. Even on my telephone, my secure telephone, I would have to type in a multi-digit code in order to unlock it. Um, this kind of thing, you know, something you have and something you know, I think is, I personally think it's a better model. Um, I don't like 
just having someone being able to take a biometric, say off a um, cell phone or, or tablet or something like that and get all the way in and get the keys to the kingdom. I'm very much in favor of just because you have something doesn't make it useful until you have something that you also know. So something you have and something you know, I think is the better model. Whether it's a combination of password with some sort of biometric or whether it's a biometric with some sort of authentication or, you know, acknowledgement, uh, something in that vein, I think, is what's going to have to happen. Otherwise, it's just a little too easy to go and steal someone's keys out of the bowl next to the front door and suddenly you have the keys to the kingdom. Uh, but that's, right. you know, my soapbox. <laughs> right now it's interesting Chuber said something you have something you know now i do remember the banks back in the day they you have the password right and then they ask you to answer a security question which most hackers can get you via social engineering and then something you know so it could be uh, uh you know again a, a additional maybe an, another ffa uh, 2fa where they send an sms message but they know that now with cloning that can be uh you know also hacked as well curtis i want to throw back to you because you brought up behavioral factors as well that but that adds some more complexity to the system doesn't it well it can add complexity but much of it is in the background you know you mentioned some of the things that are big obvious uh behavioral things like like where we uh connect from what time of day we tend to connect uh what we do when we tend to connect. But I've talked to people in the behavioral factor world who use things like the precise speed and intervals with which you type the characters of your username or how you do things on a very, very precise basis. It turns out that those are quite consistent for a user from time to time that they log in. And being able to use those can be valuable for deciding whether or not an additional challenge should be issued. For example, if you are logging in when you would normally log in uh, from the IP address from which you would normally log in and you type your username in exactly the same pattern as you always do, well, a simple biometric factor might well be enough to grant access. You've got two factors and they're both enough. If on the other hand, any of those behavioral factors um, don't match up with your normal patterns, well then perhaps there's an additional um, factor that's introduced, say a code that is sent to your phone. And yes, I know about all of the SMS um, factor issues, or perhaps a key that goes to your mobile device, something else that makes sure that you are who you are without ever requiring you to memorize and input that 27 character mixed case with special characters and numbers password that you have to change every 48 hours. Right. I agree with that. So one more question to you, Curtis, and we'll move on to the next bite. Um, you know, from an enterprise perspective, actually, obviously, we talk a lot about zero trust and and how you know we have this micro segmentation, and you know, organizations are asked to wrap security fences around all their resources. But now, doesn't the adding these additional layers to things make the password even more of a problem? And that's why the organizations need to move away from it. Well, it, it literally depends on how the idea of micro-segmentation and zero trust is implemented. Um, in my opinion, implementing it in a way that requires the human user to re-authenticate over and over and over again is the least intelligent, most intrusive way to do it, and frankly, the way that will lead to a proliferation of um, backdoor applications being used in the enterprise. Users will quite rightly see this as a waste of their time and something that impinges on their productivity and shadow IT will be their answer. 
what this does is it actually gets back to our last week's conversation where we were talking about certificates of trust and hardware security and authentication. Because if the user has authenticated to their device, once they effectively authenticate to the network, then that device can do all of the additional authentications as you go through the multiple stages of micro-segmentation authentication and zero trust. So what you're doing is la adding layers of authentication, layers of security, without adding additional stumbling blocks for legitimate users. Yes, it's more complicated for the IT and security staff, but the rewards in many cases are well worth that additional commitment. Indeed, they are. Indeed, they are. Well, you know, I think we've uh, talked enough about that. We put that one to bed. Um, you know, I think that uh, maybe we should move on. I think we're running low time on time on the bites, but we should probably move on to the guests because we do have a great guest and we're going to talk a lot about a little bit more about this uh, with her as well. But before we get to the guests, we do have to thank another great sponsor of this week in enterprise tech, and that's Worldwide Technology and Intel. WWT is at the forefront of innovation, working with their clients all over the world to transform their businesses. Now, at the heart of WWT lies their advanced technology center. It's pretty amazing. Their ATC. Now, the ATC is a research and testing lab that brings together technologies from leading OEMs. There's more than a half a billion dollars in equipment invested in that lab. Now, the ATC offers hundreds of on-demand and schedulable labs. Featuring solutions that include technologies like Intel, Xeon, scalable processors, Intel Optane, persistent memory, Optane SSDs, and other representing the newest advances in multi-cloud architecture, security networking, primary and secondary storage, data analytics, and AI, DevOps, and so much more. Now, WWT's engineers and partners use the ATC to quickly spin up proof of concepts and pilots so customers can confidently select the best solutions. Now, this helps cut evaluation time from months to weeks. Now, with the ATC, you can test out products and solutions before you go to market. Now, access technical articles, expert insights, demonstration videos, white papers, hands-on labs, and other tools that help you stay up to date with the latest technologies. Now, not only is the ATC a physical lab space, but WWT has also virtualized it. So members of their ATC platform can access these amazing resources anywhere in the world, 365 days a year. Now, while exploring the ATC platform, make sure to check out WWT's events and communities for more opportunities to learn about technology trends and hear the latest research and insights from their experts. Whatever your business need, WWT can deliver scalable, tried and tested tailored solutions. WWT brings strategy and execution together to make a new world happen. To learn more about WWT, the ATC, and get access to all their free resources, visit WWT.com slash twit and create an account on their ATC platform. That's WWT.com slash twit. And we thank WWT for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's my favorite part of the show. We actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Riot. And today we have Justine Schaffer. She's from Hummingbird Networks. Welcome to the show, Justine. Hi, thank you. Now, our audience loves, loves to hear people's origin stories. Can you maybe take us through a short journey through tech and what brought you to Hummingbird Networks? Yeah, yeah. So I'm the marketing director uh, for Hummingbird Networks. I've been there about uh, six years now. Um, I had no background in IT. Honestly, didn't understand anything. Uh, just I knew online. That's it. Um, so I think what really got me kind of, you know, into IT uh, was probably one of my first shows with Hummingbird. We went to uh, Cisco Live about four or five years ago. And um, I was hooked. I couldn't, like, consume enough content learning about IT. Um called myself an IT geek after that and just <laughs> ran with it. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, you know, we've talked a lot about remote work here um, on the show, a lot about how organizations are accelerating their, uh, you know, their move to the cloud because of it. 
Um, now, we've talked a lot about, we, in fact, even this show, but our previous shows as well, we talked a lot about the challenges around identity and, and the idea of passwords. What are you seeing in the trend-wise uh, organizations doing uh, and other challenges they're running into when it comes to the remote work and, and kind of moving to the cloud? Yeah, we saw a big scramble last year, uh, last March, uh, the beginning of COVID with this. And we saw a lot of people jumping on the single sign-on or the two-factor. Um, our company went with the two-factor authentication and everybody had to kind of learn. Um, it's, it's simple, it's easy. Um, but with that, we also had to really educate everybody about layers. Like now you have everybody remote you're giving them this single sign-on um, ease of use into the network. Now you need to really make sure that you have all the layers in place to protect your network. Right, right. Now, um, the interesting thing is, um, you know, we, we see a lot of organizations, like you said, adding the single sign-on uh, mm -hmm. in conjunction with some of these other technologies too. Uh, what are some of the challenges that organizations are dealing with there, though, with having to deal with you know, enabling single sign-on, enabling 2FA and MFA? Um, single sign-on is great as long as you monitor for changes. Um, you know, you're adaptively applying policies, you're enforcing the best practices, um, and then you have the zoning in your firewall so that if somebody does get in, if somebody does get somebody's password and is able to get in, that they're only able to access the applications that that user has access to. Um, just basically staying on top of it and denying um, authorization based on policy, mismatch or match. Right, right. Now, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about the fact that, uh, you know, your most organizations weakest link is most likely their users, especially ones that are working yeah. from their remote and uh, remote locations, whether it's at home or home networks. What are some of the, uh, you know, the human factors around remote access that essentially, uh, you know, create more complexity there? Um, it's probably, you know, zero trust, trust no one. Um, you have to just make sure that everybody is up to date and securing their, uh, user, their devices, um, device management, management is probably your top priority. Um, especially with remote workers being logged in, you know, over here, over there, maybe they leave home and they go to a, a guest network or they go somewhere else to just get quiet. You know, they, they need quiet from their house or whatever. Um, so just making sure that your end user devices are protected as well with that. So interestingly, you say end user devices. So you're talking a lot about like whether it's their mobile phones or. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. So we had talked about a story a couple weeks ago um, where we're talking about the fact that most users, maybe if they do secure their devices, they could still be insecure because of, let's say, a insecure wireless access point or, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're, they're not segmenting their home network because they're using their work machines with other consumer devices that may not be secure. What are what are some of the organizations doing to to kind of get beyond all that? Is, is it, You talked a little bit about education of users. Is that part of it? Yeah. Um, social engineering is a big thing. I mean, like you said, the weakest link is always going to be your employee, typically. Um and then we're a big believer in layers. Um, I always use the house analogy or the castle analogy. You know, you lock your front door. You're always going to make sure that your windows are locked or your back door. Um, so just having like the multiple layer of security in place. So not just setting up your firewall, but also zoning the firewall for uh, allowing different users access to different applications and not allowing like a straight open um, networks or a VPN, really just segmenting it out. Right, right. Um, so let me ask you a question. Uh, you know, not that there's ever a silver lining that it come when it comes to pandemics, but are you seeing that potentially due to the more remote workers that are out there um, and the fact that uh, obviously hackers are kind of on the prowl because of the fact that there's more remote workers, that it's pushing organizations to do more things here? Oh, yeah, definitely. I definitely think it's making everybody relook the way that they're doing business in general. And then hopefully everybody's looking at their security. Um, 
I, we've seen a, a huge uptake in people not having to even think about that before. You know, working from home was kind of like a luxury. Um, now it's <laughs> becoming a standard and becoming a norm. So we've seen a huge uptake in businesses of all sizes. Okay, you know, uh, check my network, make sure that we have everything in place, make sure that, you know, this one can access these files and um, just really honing in on their security. Big top of mind. Right, right. Um, so one thing that, you know, obviously we talked a little about, okay, the fact that there's no silver lining potentially with the pandemic, but the fact that we're also seeing a lot of customers move to remote, what are you seeing them do to, to enable remote access? Um, is, is maybe the pandemic helping here, maybe hindering that, 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 that market segment? I, I see it as a silver lining that very, you know, few good things can come out of such a issue that we went through. But I've seen so many companies, you know, either uh, switch to hybrid or full remote. You know, they're they're losing some of their smaller offices or downsizing their office. And they realize now after they've implemented everything that, hey, working from home is working. Um, and it brings, you know, uh, employee happiness. It can attract, you know, an, another set of um Sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here, but just, you know, it, it just brings a, a play freedom and happiness. And I, we've seen a lot of people just fully on full on switch to a remote or hybrid workforce. Right, right. Well, I do want to bring my co-host back in here. Uh, Cheaper, start with you first. Well, I want to ask a little bit about human factors. Um, we talk about training and we talk about our... Um, our user community needing to learn how to do things. But human factors for remote access, um, what kinds of training materials have you been um, suggesting to your customers? Um, we've heard people talking about gamifying some of the training. Have you seen any kind of success with that type of approach to training? Yeah, I've seen a lot of uh, the partners that we're working just scramble and put as much content as they can. Um, it, it, you can, I mean, you can make all kinds of content and all kinds of training for, for people. It's basically just educating them that they need to update the OS, uh, their desktop or their mobile device, staying on top of updates, um, and ha it adds more to an IT person's already full, full plate. Um, but checking in with employees and making sure that they are staying on top of updating because I, for most employees, that's the last thing that they're looking at. They just kind of, yeah, postpone, postpone, postpone the update. Um, so that's what I would strongly suggest is just making sure that everybody's staying on top of the updates. Yeah, well, we're all in agreement. IT <laughs> is overloaded. March, oh, yeah. March, April is horrible. Um, <laughs> And we're not we're not being allowed to hire. So as a integrator, as a consulting firm and so forth, are there tools to help? You know, there, th can we automate some of these functions for things like endpoint auditing or even endpoint um, inventory? You know, how do we inventory what's out there, especially since a lot of people are starting to talk about getting away from those El cheapo consumer firewalls and putting enterprise grade out at the um, at the end user level. What kinds of automation have you been able to suggest to your customers that can solve this lack of warm bodies? Um, you know, I know we offer some services. Um, like you said, though, I mean, budget and IT is always tight. Uh, I know we've come up with some services, kind of user training. Um, where we can show the end user what they need to do, what steps they need to make to make to take it off the IT person or IT director's uh, hands and kind of uh, push the employee through training. We have some in place too. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks, Justine. We'll, we'll definitely, I definitely want to bring Kurt back in as well. But before we get to Kurt, I do want to thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that is IT Pro TV. Now, now, if you're considering a career in IT or you're currently employed in one of its many fields, you should know the importance of certifications. Now, a certification proves to employers or future employers that you have the skills 
and the knowledge for the job. Now, because tech is constantly evolving, certs only last so long. Now, it's important that you stay on top of recertification and are aware of updates so you don't have to take the, another exam if you fail to recertify in time. Now, certifications are one of the reasons why IT Pro TV can be vital to your career. Now, IT Pro TV can be, get you both certified and recertified in CompTIA, Cisco, ISC2, Axelos, Microsoft, and many more. They will tell you how long a cert will last and give you the tools to complete it. Now, IT Pro TV gives you a well-rounded educational experience with virtual labs, practice tests, and fun, entertaining teachers they call edutainers. They won't bore you, and they have fun making sure you know your stuff. Now, our reviewer states, IT Pro TV is hands down the best LMS sites I've used. I have ascertained four certs using IT Pro TV. The edutainers are the best in my experience. The wonderful reviews for IT Pro TV go on and on. IT Pro TV has seven studios and over 5,800 hours of engaging video training, and they're constantly adding and updating their content every day. So you're always given the latest information. The best part is your training can happen anytime from the comfort of your own home on your own schedule. Stream IT Pro TV's courses live and on demand worldwide via Chromecast, Roku, Apple TV, PC, or their iOS and Android apps as well. May is cloud month at IT Pro TV. They have training on all three major cloud providers, AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud Platform. Now, if you're interested in learning IT or getting certified for the IT job you want, you'll absolutely benefit from IT Pro TV. Start or advance your IT career today. Go to itpro.tv slash enterprise and use code enterprise30 to receive 30% off all consumer subscriptions. That's itpro.tv slash enterprise and use code enterprise30 for an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. IT Pro TV, build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. And we thank IT Pro TV for their support of this week and enterprise tech. Well, folks, we've been talking with Justine Schaffer from Hummingbird Networks about remote work and the complexities behind actually transferring and translating your network to the cloud. Um, you know, I do want to bring my co-host back in here, though. I want to start with Kurt. Do you, Kurt? Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, my first question is, we all realized that a little over a year ago, most organizations had to undergo a rapid, massive change in the way they did IT. My question to you is, as you look at your customer base, as they look back at, you know, coming back into the office, are they trying to revert to what they had, say, 20 months ago? Or do they seem to be more interested in creating a new kind of infrastructure to deal with, well, a new kind of hybrid workforce? Yeah, we see the latter, where they are starting to implement a more hybrid workforce. Um, we've seen people return to the office, um, but I've seen it either they're, you know, in a couple of days a week or they're not in as much because they're still doing social distancing. Everybody's kind of spacing out a little bit more. So not everybody is allowed to come back. Um, but we are seeing pe companies starting to implement uh, the ability to do the hybrid workforce rather than just everybody coming on back into the office. Well, as they're Building this workforce, I'm curious, you know, there are obviously some very large organizations that have a very capable and large staff to go in and do whatever kind of deployment is required. And then there are very tiny companies that probably didn't have to deal with such complexity. What kind of companies are you finding that get the most value from bringing in a value-added reseller or systems integrator, someone to to help them with the kind of deployment changes that we're talking about? It's probably going to be in the SMB space, uh, somebody who has the tighter IT department, IT network, um, usually benefits from working with us. I mean, we do go up to enterprise, but most of the time our sweet spot where we see the most uh, help needed 
is going to be in the small, medium business, maybe under a thousand seats, 500 seats. Very interesting. And are you seeing that, you know, there are particular um, market segments, different kinds of industries that are either having particular difficulties in making this translation or, on the other hand, are finding it, uh, you know, falling off a log easy? We're all over the place, but I typically I would say those that really have to uh, monitor their security and monitor their compliance. So whether that be, you know, somebody dealing with sensitive information, um, you know, doctor's offices, law offices, uh, just somebody that really needs to monitor their their data, which everybody does, obviously, but uh, those industries that really have to monitor the information that they have in their network. Right, right, right. Well, Justine, thank you so much for me here. We are running a little bit low on time, but I did want to give you a chance to tell the folks at home uh, where people can go, maybe learn a little bit more about Hummingbird Networks and uh, maybe where, how they can get started. Yeah, so uh, we are a provider of IT equipment and services. We've been in business for over 16 years. Uh, we are a woman-owned business, and we have everything we you need to help build your network, um, whether you're working from home or in an office. We work with enterprise, small business, and home-based home -based users. Sorry, um, We'd love to help you out. We have tons of resources on our website. Uh, you can visit us at hummingbirdnetworks.com. And uh, thank you for having me on. Thank you. Thank you. Well, folks, you've done it again. You've sat through another hour of the Best Thing Enterprise podcast in the universe. So definitely tune your podcatcher to Twyet. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my co-hosts. They are the best in the universe, starting with our very own Mr. Brian G. Brian, what's going on for you in the coming week? Where can people find you? Well, you know. I'm trying to put my home lab back together. I've got a whole bunch of IoT things that I want to build, not the least of which is I've promised my buddy Kurt that I'd go and build him a little um, device that will harvest the temperature of his pool, the temperature of the outside air, maybe some wind speed and humidity and so forth, and be able to present it so that his Amazon Echo can go and be queried by it. Um, so he can just go and ask Alexa, hmm, What's the temperature of the pool? Anyway, you know, I still want to I, I want to hear from the viewers. We want ideas. We want your comments. I, we've got pretty thick skin. So on Twitter, I'm ADVNETLAB, Advanced Net Lab. Or if you want, I'm Chebert, spelled C-H-E-E-B-E-R-T. Yeah, I, my students and I had a Dilbert theme. Also like Mr. Peabody here. So I'm Chebert at twit.tv. But if you want to toss an email at all the hosts, why don't you try twiet at twit.tv. And we'd love to hear your ideas and show suggestions. Thank you, Chebert. Appreciate you being here. Well, we also have to thank Mr. Curtis Franklin as well. Curtis, what's going on for you in the coming, coming week? And where can people find you? Well, as always, I'll be tweeting out uh, on the Tweety Pipes, uh, letting people know what's going on. Starting to get ready for Black Hat USA. I'm going to be doing a presentation there, and so I'm starting to put together my ideas. I'm also, uh, let's see, what areas am I researching? Doing some work on vulnerability management right now, uh, of figuring out who's who and what they're doing, and getting ready for a larger project in the fall on enterprise security management, especially going to be starting out in two areas there. One is on training and education for users. The other one, well, that's going to be fun because I'm going to be looking at dashboards. I'm also going to be looking into some of the areas around visibility into networks and especially risk management. What, how do you manage risk as part of managing the enterprise security posture? That's, uh, that's going to be fun. It's going to keep me up a lot, and it's going to give me much more hands-on time with uh, spreadsheets than I'm used to. But I think it's going to be fun, and I can't wait to tell the world about it. 
fantastic. Thank you, Carol. Spreadsheets are definitely fun. Thanks, guys, for being here. Well, we also have to thank you as well. You're the person who drops in each and every week to watch and listen to our show to get your enterprise and IT news goodness. We want to make it easy for you to watch and listen to and catch up on your enterprise news. Go to our show page right now, twit.tv slash twy. There you'll find all the amazing back episodes, the show notes, the co-host information, the guest information, and the links of the stories we do during the show. But more importantly, next to those videos, you'll see those helpful subscribe and download links as well. Support the show by getting your audio version, your video version of your choice and listen in on any one of your pod catcher application pod, podcast applications because we're on all of them. So definitely subscribe now. Plus, you may have heard we had a major announcement just recently. That's Club Twit. That's right. Well, what is it? Well, it's a member only ad free podcast service with that bonus Twit Plus feed. Plus, you get to join the club for only seven dollars per month and you'll even get exclusive access to member only discord channels. Now, I'm in them right now, and I can tell you there's a lot of great characters in there, some great discussions, and some great stuff going on. Uh, in fact, we get to actually watch Leo play some video games, too, which is actually really a lot of fun. Like, I'm learning some things about some of the latest and greatest games that are out there. That is at twit.tv slash club twit. Definitely join and as well subscribe. Now, after you subscribe, impress your friends and your family members and your coworkers with the gift of Twiat because – we talk a lot about some fun tech topics on this show, and I can guarantee they will find them interesting and fun as well. Now, if you've already subscribed and you're available on these days at 1.30 p.m. Pacific Fridays, we do the show live. That's at live.twit.tv. There you can come see how the pizza is made, the behind the scenes, all the fun stuff we do here at Twit. Of course, if you're going to watch the show live, you might as well jump into our IRC chat room live as well. That's irc.twit.tv. There you can join some really amazing characters that have been there for many, many years and over the years with us, as well as some of the new characters that are there asking some latest, greatest questions to us. And we actually veer the show based off of some of that as well. So definitely jump into the chat room and join the community there as well. Now, if you can't watch the show live and you want to be still part of the community and ask questions, you can also check out our twit.community website. There we have 24-7 discussions, and we also have some really great topics about technology and other things. So go definitely check out twit.community. Remember, you can always... Follow me at twitter.com slash Lou MM. There I post all my enterprise tidbits. Plus, I get to have, have the great great conversations with people like you. So definitely come out and join the conversation. Plus, I also post some of my normal work week items there at Microsoft. Um, if you want to check that out, you can also go to developers.microsoft.com slash office. There we post all the latest and greatest ways to customize your office experience for your organization. And definitely also check out Office Scripts because that's the new way – of actually creating macros for your web documents, your Excel documents. So definitely check that out. It's a lot of fun. Now, I also want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support the Screen Enterprise Tech each and every week, and we couldn't do this show without them. So thank you for all their support. Definitely to thank you to all the engineers and staff at Twit. And, of course, also thank you to Mr. Brian G. Chebert one more time because he's not only our, our co-host, but he's also our tireless producer. He does all the bookings and the plannings for the show. So thank you to him and all his support because we really couldn't do the show without him. Also, thank you before we sign out to Mr. Victor. He is our editor. He makes us look good. He gets rid of all the, the messiness that we have during the show. So thank you to him uh, and all his support. Of course, thank you to our TD Today, John. John, we really appreciate you. What's going on over there at Twit uh, this week? You saw Leo's. I don't know if you saw Leo's uh, Nixie Clock. That was pretty exciting on Wednesday when he put together his Nixie Clock. And it's always a blast to come in on Fridays and see you guys. I uh, I kind of miss you. Let an ant take over all the fun. Well, we appreciate you being here. Thank you for being here, Jen. Well, until next time, I'm Louis Moresca. Just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Ant Pruitt, and I want to tell you about my show, Hands on Photography, here on Twit TV. Each and every week, Thursday, that is, I like to sit down and share with you the best tips and tricks that are going to help make you a better photographer. And it's not always about Photoshop. It's not always about just having the biggest and baddest and bestest camera. It can be the simplest of things like leave your eye open when you're looking through the viewfinder. All of these simple tips can really help step your photography game up. So subscribe to the show today. That's twit.tv slash hop. And I look forward to talking to you soon.